five years, and I just recently started um, in the appellate division of PDS, but that's only temporary. Um, mental health is my, my love and my passion of my life, and I would say out of all of the things that I do as a mental health lawyer, the most difficult and most challenging and also most rewarding thing that I do is fight for people's right to be free from forced medication. And um, I, I'm really glad that this panel is happening today because I, and that it's happening in the context of the DC Bar and Judicial Conference because I think a lot of people, including a lot of attorneys, think that the question of whether or not someone should take medication is a medical issue. And it is a medical issue, but it's also a legal issue. And I think it's the responsibility of any lawyer who has a client with a, men with a mental illness, um, whether that client is in the civil commitment system or in the criminal justice system, to um, represent that client in such a way that the attorney is advocating for the client's stated interest rather than their best interest. Um, there are a lot of things, there are a lot of people in the system, um, doctors, prosecutors, judges, um, practitioners, case managers, who are trying to decide what is best for the person, what is best for a person with mental illness. And for a lot of those people, that's their job. Or they see that as their job. And, and so I see it as the role of attorneys to be the one person that is in the corner unconditionally of a person with a mental illness and advocating for their stated and expressed interests um, in terms of receiving treatment. You know, a lot of, a lot of the, the talk at this conference is about connecting with people with services, connecting people with treatment. Um, and, and what I want to emphasize today is that not everyone who needs treatment wants every single kind of treatment that's available. And a very common kind of treatment that's offered um, is medication. And for a lot of reasons, there are a lot of people who either don't want to take particular medications or don't want to take psychotropic medication at all. Um, and so I see it as my job to defend the rights of those particular individuals to refrain from taking medication if that's what they want to do, whether their reasons appear to me um, as a person who doesn't have that lived experience to be rational or irrational. So I'm, I'm hoping that today we can have some exploration of not only what the law is, but what the law should be, um, and how we should think about not only our civil system and our criminal justice system, but our society, and what kind of society do we want to live in, and, and what kind of <coughs> what kind of civil and human rights, as Leah put it, should people have to make decisions about what actually happens to their physical bodies, their brains, um, and their minds. Thank you, and thank you for that, that introduction, everybody. Um, and we are going to delve into all of those questions, but before we get into um, talking about the law and what it is and what it should likely look like with medication, um, I want to take a step back and talk a little bit about what mental illness is, because we've been here all day talking about mental illness, but we haven't really uh, dissected uh, what, what it is that we're talking about here. Um, and commonly when people talk about mental illness, they talk about it like diabetes, and they talk about it like a condition that can be measured through tests and corrected through medication. I've heard some of that today as well. Um, but when you drill down a bit, mental illness, at least in the United States, are mostly defined by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, is everybody familiar with that, the DSM. And that's a book that's published periodically by the American Psychiatric Association. It defines and categorizes specific mental illnesses and describes the symptoms of those illnesses. Um, in 2013, the American Psychiatric uh, Association uh, published a new version, and a fascinating debate uh, <coughs> broke out. Uh, the National Institute of Mental Health critiqued the new version as not being scientifically based, um, as just clusters of symptoms and experiences without any scientific measures. And then other people critiqued it as being an over-medicalization of normal responses to abnormal situations. Um, and the first question is for Leah related specifically to the concept of normal responses to abnormal situations. We've done a lot of writing and thinking about these issues, um, and especially about the prevalence of trauma in the group of people we're talking about that use mental health care. Can you talk a bit about this body of research and how it could impact how we think about people's experiences that are hearing voices or having suspicious, suspicious thoughts or whistling? Yeah, and, and 
I think, you know, when people make these claims, mental illness is like any other illness, you know, I really encourage everyone to investigate that claim. Um, because in my experience and experience of many other people, it's not. You know, it's, it's far more complicated. And, and like Jen said, there's not a blood test. They're looking for the genetic basis of these illnesses and still haven't found it. And, you know, maybe 30, 40 years they'll find something. But, but basically that it, these are very complex uh, patterns of behavior and experience that are, you know, part nature, part nurture. You know, it's, it's a, it absolutely is a different mix for, for everybody. So I think one thing that we can see when we look at people who are engaging with various systems, whether it's the mental health system, uh, substance use, criminal justice, juvenile justice, all of our different systems, is that there is a high prevalence of trauma. And, and I'm talking about uh, abuse, you know, experiences of childhood abuse, uh, neglect, there may be current interpersonal violence going on or domestic violence situations. Homelessness is in and of itself traumatic. And we now know that traumatic experience, whether past and present, actually does have an effect on the developing brain. The science is clear <laughs> on that. The genetic basis of mental illness is not clear, but the science is clear that in a person's experience, and particularly in their early childhood, um, significantly affects the developing brain and can have consequences that last uh, throughout the lifespan. So this, the science is clear on this. There is a, if you look at the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which basically was a collaboration between Kaiser Permanente and the CDC, which in 1997 surveyed 17,000 patients about basically 10 categories of adverse childhood experience. And they found what is known as the dose response effect. So the more, uh, the higher your ACE score, the more ch adverse childhood experiences you've, you've had, the higher your likelihood in a dose response effect you are to have physical health problems, COPD, you know, every kind of health problem, um, mental health problems, emotional <coughs> problems, um, behavioral problems, you know, that all of these can be connected to uh, the early trauma that someone experiences. And that is, is not to say that uh, adverse childhood experiences are destiny any more than a mental health diagnosis is destiny and that certainly there are interventions, there are trauma-informed approaches to being with people that can help, you know, to reverse this kind of really uh, damaging and difficult cycle. But I just, you know, I could sort of spout statistics at you all day, but I just kind of wanted to share some of these about the prevalence of trauma. Um, Two-thirds of suicide attempts among adults attributed to adverse childhood experiences. 80% of suicide attempts during adolescence or childhood attributed to adverse childhood experiences. Um, for incarcerated women, the prevalence of adverse childhood experiences is near 100%. Um, people living with HIV, AIDS, you know, have a very high prevalence of childhood and adult trauma, um, which affects, you know, treatment adherence. Um, and when it comes to psychosis, those, you know, experiences that are diagnosed as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, um, there have been an influx of studies proving an undeniable link between childhood chronic trauma and psychotic states. And again, this dose-response effect, which shows that this is not just correlation, this is actual causation. Uh, it really points us more in the direction of understanding that this is causative of psychotic states. Um, and, you know, this is slowly catching on in, in the mainstream. Um, but, you know, some of these statistics are really startling, that, that those abused as children are nine times more likely to develop psychotic symptoms. Um, those suffering the most severe levels of abuse, 48 times more likely to develop psychotic symptoms, like hearing voices or dissociation. Um, there was a 2000 study in the Schizophrenia Bulletin that found that they looked at five areas of trauma, and people who had experienced all five of those areas of, of traumatic experience were 193 times more likely to become psychotic. So I think we really need to see, particularly in these, you know, what is um, called severe mental illness, that very, very often, certainly this is not the case for every person, you know, but that we can almost assume you know, that a person has had some kind of past or present ongoing 
a traumatic experience. And so we can see that the voice hearing and dissociative behavior is actually an adaptive response to trauma. You know, that a lot of people, when they talk about hearing voices, it started after particularly, you know, horrendous experiences of abuse, you know, and that voices can get worse when people are going through some kind of stressful situation in their, in their current life. So I think, you know, this is very, very important to see that, you know, it, it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you. You know, that is the underlying question guiding trauma-informed approaches. And I think this is really important, too, because the studies have shown that when we look at people's problems purely through the lens of biology, well, there's always, we're biological beings, but when we look at and frame problems purely in this biological, you know, arena, it actually decreases clinician empathy. Research has shown that. But when you look at people in the context of their life experience and what's going on, you know, with them, what's happened to them, it actually increases the empathy of, of uh of clinicians. Um, so coming to the medication issue, and I'll wrap up. <laughs> um, <coughs> so medication, in the case when someone, really their, their issues are caused by, by traumatic stress, repeated, you know, adverse experiences through childhood, perhaps into adulthood, medication can, can temporarily kind of dampen down some of the symptoms, the really troubling symptoms that people have. And it doesn't do that for everybody either but it may kind of <coughs> quiet the voices, but it does not address the root causes of what is going on with the person. You know, it's a tool, it's not a cure. Um, so I think that when we really understand that what is so often going on for people is trauma, you know, meds aren't gonna, aren't gonna fix that. You know, um, that they're, they're just sort of one of many things that can or should be happening in that person's life. Um, and, and just, you know, the fact that I feel like there are, now that we know the high prevalence of trauma, I think we have an, have an ethical obligation to act in ways that do not further re-traumatize individuals. And people who've experienced abuse have experienced a loss of agency. They've experienced people exerting power over them. And so forced interventions can have a way of kind of, you know, almost uncannily reenacting original forms of abuse that people have experienced. Um, so I think, you know, there is now a trend, you know, in healthcare to really have a more trauma-informed approach to services. And the, the center of a trauma-informed approach is that you really try to honor a person's dignity, right to choose, you know, all those kinds of things that help people regain and feel a sense of power when they felt so powerless in their lives before. So I've talked a lot. I, I could talk about this all day. But I want to make sure to make time for others. Yes. I have a question. You were addressing primarily childhood abuse. So what the, about abuse as an adult? Exactly. And so a lot of people not only have a history of early childhood adversity, but because of that trauma history, there's a higher likelihood to get into situations where they can continue to be re-traumatized, like uh, domestic violence situations or people who become homeless, who you know are exposed to violence. So it's not it's generally not isolated in childhood, you know, that people who've experienced a high A score, you know, continue to have traumatic experience, uh, that that can happen. And it's not, it's not everybody's story, but we've often, you know, heard these kinds of stories in, in, in the work that, that we do around this. Thank you. And I just want to point out, if um, people are interested in this, there's a uh, op-ed in your handout, number three on page 18. Uh, by an anthropologist, I believe, called Redefining Mental Illness, and if people want to check that out and learn a little bit more about these ideas of, of trauma and mental health and um, questions about how we define mental health, that's a great starting story. Um, thank you. And uh, Larry, you segued perfectly into my next question, so thank you. Uh, David, uh, Dr. Freeman, I was going to ask um, if you could give some more background on just what common psychotropic medications are? What is it that we're talking about? And in doing so, um, address some of the common side effects, uh, but also you could uh, talk about the point that Leia raised about whether she mentioned them damping down um, symptoms but not really addressing the root causes. If you could address sort of whether these, these medications treat diseases or how they manage, or rather how they manage symptoms. A simple question. Um, <laughs> so, um, um, first question. 
emphasize that I'm a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, um, and so I don't prescribe medication um, in the district. Um, although some days that might be possible. <laughs> um, um, but however, I've been working with people who take medication, and I've been working with psychiatrists who prescribe it for, for uh, almost four years. So I'm really speaking from that experience. Um, I should say, you know, before answering Jen's question directly, um, I, I find myself already in a very awkward position because I'm wearing all the time two hats as we're talking. Um, on the one hand, you know, I, I am drawn to the field of mental health and I've trained probably several thousand people um, in the time that I've been a psychologist um, because I'm interested in helping people. Because I'm interested in trying to figure out what are they thinking, how are they feeling, what do they want to do with their lives, where are they going, what are they up against. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, I approach things from a person-centered perspective. In other words, who are you, and where are you going, and how can I help? And on the other hand, I'm faced every day with some pretty significant decisions. So, for example. Or am I going to write an, a, a, a petition to have somebody involuntarily committed to a hospital, an FD12 in the district? Am I going to seek uh, to support um, continued civil commitment of an individual after a year has gone by? Uh, I'll get a call from the Office of the Attorney General. Your document is due. You need to tell us whether or not you want to keep this patient committed. I'll get a call from the Business Improvement District downtown. Hey, one of your clients is over here. He's harassing the people at the 7-Eleven. He, he smells terrible. He's barely dressed. He's screaming and shouting. It seems like he's talking to himself. Would you please come fix the problem? Um, and so there's, there's this uh, tension between a person-centered approach, where I want to get to know the person, and uh, a, a kind of an action-oriented approach where I have to somehow or other, quote unquote, fix the problem that, that we're presented with. Uh, and there's a kind of a, you know, this plays out in a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, we're talking about best interest versus stated interest. Well, the stated interest of somebody who is acutely psychotic is to, you know, 